Okay, good morning again, chair, board members, chief operating officer and staff. A few housekeeping rules, as I said before, if you're not speaking um, or presenting or asking a question or whatever, please, please, please mute your microphones uh, as a courtesy to uh, everyone else. And so that um, we will to avoid uh, and minimize background interference. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll do a formal roll call as we always do. Chair Russ, present. Present. Vice Chair Gonzalez. Vice Chair Gonzalez, unmute and say present, please. Vice Chair Gonzalez is on. He's muted um, for the record. He's on. Uh, Member Adams. Here. Thank you. Member Austin. Present. Thank you. Member Gavin. Present. Thank you. Member Gawold. Present. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, Chief Operating Officer, Vito. Present. Thank you so much. Madam Chair. Yes. I finally got, I finally got the, the thing unmuted. Present. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Appreciate it. Um, Chair, mm -hmm. there are no members of the public who registered mm -hmm. as required in order to provide comments. As such, we will proceed with the regular calendar. And the first order of business is to adopt the minutes of the regular meeting of Wednesday, October 27, 2021. Do I have a motion? Gavin. Motion, so Vice Chair. Gavin. Um, seconded by? Second, Vice Chair. Vice Chair. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All Aye. And none opposed. Thank you very much. We will now proceed to the reports item on the agenda. Chair, would you like to provide any remarks before we begin with our first and only presentation? Uh, no, no remarks um, uh, for this meeting. Okay, thank you so much. We will move on to a presentation on winter preparedness overview. And it's being co-presented by Javier Almodovar, Director of Heating Management Services, and John Imhoff, Vice President for Operations Support Services. Javier and John. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Chief Operating Officer, distinguished members of the board, and all those in attendance today. My name is John Imhoff. I recently joined NYCHA as the Vice President for Operations Support Services. I'm accompanied today by Javier Almodovar, the Director of the Heating Management Services Department. We're here today to present NYCHA's winter preparedness efforts in anticipation of the current heating season. As you are all well aware, NYCHA serves roughly 285 developments with over 2,200 buildings throughout the city of New York, which contain over 168,000 apartments and is home to more than 358,000 residents. The Heating Management Services Department is responsible for 1,351 of NYCHA's aging boilers a substantial number of which are quite old and well past their useful life expectancy. Meaning those boilers and ancillary equipment should there theoretically be inoperative. Regardless, each year, NYCHA faces the demand of maintaining the safe, continuous and reliable operation of these heating plants to provide the much needed heat that its residents both need and deserve. Although each year NYCHA as a whole rises to the challenge, the majority of the efforts are exerted by the Heating Management Services Department run by Director Almodovar. While most of us would not expect a 25 to 40 year old car to reliably get us to work every day, despite our best efforts to maintain that car, Mr. Almodovar is tasked with the enormous responsibility of keeping these plants in operation to provide heat throughout the entire season and to provide hot water all year long. Although unlike a rundown car, a heating outage is a life safety issue. So no amount of outages should ever be acceptable. It then becomes understandable to focus on the few residents without heat at any given time, while losing sight of what needed to be done to ensure that all of the others do. This is accomplished through rigorous inspection and preventive maintenance schedules and the endless repair efforts made by the Heating Management Services Department. However, no amount of preventative maintenance and repairs could ever reverse time and restore a boiler to new condition. As the equipment ages with each passing year, the challenge becomes greater and greater. In theory, Outages are not only inevitable, but over time should also increase in both frequency and duration. 
To improve those statistics and reverse those numbers borders the impossible. However, NYCHA and more specifically Javier's team has done just that for the past few years. With that being said, I'd like to turn over the remainder of the presentation to Javier, who will explain what he and his team have done in preparation for this heating season. Thank you, John, and uh, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Good morning, Chair, Chief Operating Officer, Board members, and all in attendance today. Thank you for allowing me to present my department's winter preparedness overview. Through this brief um, presentation, I hope to briefly explain how we actually uh, prepare. So the first slide, I'd like to start with a brief overview. As everyone uh, in attendance knows, HMSD is responsible for providing heat and hot water services to NYCHA's residents citywide. The way we do this is with our greatest asset, our staff. HMSD has approximately 600 employees dedicated to maintaining and repairing our heating and hot water systems, which include boilers, heat distribution equipment, hot water gen and hot water generating uh, systems. Within that 600 staff is our heat desk personnel. Heating management is a 24 hour hey, operation. Okay. I'm sorry? Heating management is a 24 hour operation and our heat desk is responsible for tracking, monitoring and reporting on all heat and hot water service interruptions. They do this by reviewing Maximo, <clears throat> our work ticket system, excuse me. <clears throat> wow. And our remote uh, monitoring system, which include CHAZ and now the, uh, the new building management system. Uh, another resource used uh, for winter preparedness is our active contracts. This is a great resource that we use widely. Uh, currently, we have 20 active contracts with a remaining capacity of uh, roughly $96 million. Next slide, please. I think everyone is very familiar with this, uh, with this slide. This, of course, is our temperature requirement. Um, we're required to provide uh, temperatures in apartments at 68 degrees from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. when the outdoor temperature drops below 55. And this, of course, is at the start of the heating season, which is October 1st through May 31st. And then overnight, a 62 degree uh, apartment temperature is required with no outdoor uh, requirement. Next slide. Um, and of course, this is our uh, heating season overview. Uh, this slide shows a consistent reduction in heat outages and service restoration times for the past three years. And it's through our two proven methods, our annual preventive maintenance process and our operation investment strategy, which I'll talk about a little bit more in, uh, in this presentation, that uh, HMSD has been able to reduce the total number of service disruptions and average restorations time consistently for the past three years. Next slide. So our annual <clears throat> preventive maintenance. Our annual equipment preventive maintenance process is a proven method, as I said before, designed to restore the equipment's uh, reliability. We do this by taking it apart, cleaning it internally and externally. We lubricate it, we replace the worn parts, worn parts and uh, inspect the equipment before we put it back into service. We, we perform this level of, uh, of maintenance on our boilers, hot water generating equipment and our uh, heat distribution equipment as well. Although the slide shows that we're at 98% with our conventional boilers, we're actually now up to 99%, which is great, which means that the remaining 15 boilers that we have now, we're, we're working through, through the uh, follow-up repairs, which include boiler welding and some gas train restoration, uh, which follows the, the replacement of um, gas line components. Our distribution systems, it shows that we're at 99%, which is accurate. We have 24 uh, dis pieces of distribution equipment remaining that are amongst the units that uh, need replacing that we're working with our operations, our operation investment strategy to, uh, to replace. Hot water systems, we're actually at 100%. The remaining work orders are in the process of, of being finalized and closed out so that we can show that number on our uh, heating dashboard. Next slide, please. So as I said before, one, one of our um, uh, strategies to prepare for the, that we've been using to prepare for the past three years is our uh, operational investments. 
Um, and for the past three years, as I said, we have identified areas where we could improve heating and hot water equipment performance by replacing the equipment itself or replacing a major component of that system. Through this, strat through this strategy so far this year, we have completed 129 projects totaling $17.9 million. And we still have about $2.1 million invested in equipment that we're looking to uh, replace before the end of this year. <clears throat> Excuse me. And as you can see from this chart, that our greatest investment is in distribution and actual equipment replacement. Next slide. <clears throat> so some of our uh, strategies that, that we've, we've uh, used for the past three years, of course, as I said before, our greatest um, resource is our staff. So it makes sense to increase our staffing levels. Uh, and so we've increased our plumbing teams from 12 plumbing teams to 28 plumbing teams. We also added two plumbing supervisors earlier this year. And we added six electrical teams and one electrical supervisor just before the start of this heating season. Um, HMSD also has, we also have our own mobile boilers. We manage 31 in total mobile boilers, 10 that are ready right now for deployment, 18 that are cur currently out and installed and or staged at specific locations, and three of which we expect before the end of this year. Uh, two, I believe, are coming this week, and the last one is coming mid-December. So in total, we'll, we'll have th we have 31 mobile boilers that we manage. Uh, we also um, anticipate two additional rental units before the end of this week as well. We're working with our rental contractor to provide us with uh, additional rental uh, units so that we can use them and have them on the ready. One strategy that's in place and continues to progress is the launching of a centralized storeroom, which uh, we, we launched out in Brooklyn, where we're using it to support our uh, service disruption uh, restoration protocol. And currently there are over 1200 items uh, that can be used to support that protocol right now in stock. And of course we have our active contracts. These, these contracts, are an added resource that we lean on in cases of emergency, and we utilize heavily to support our operational investment strategy. Next slide. So even with all our preparation efforts, we still run into unforeseen events, just like we did before the start of this heating season. Storm Ida hit, uh, and it, it affected 18 developments with excessive rainfall. Um, the, the, in some cases, entire heating plants were inundated with water. In other cases, it was maybe one or two of the boilers that, that had water coming in from above. Uh, feed water pumps were completely inundated. Some pumps in our boiler rooms, oil transfer pumps, uh, heat control panels, vacuum tanks, and hot water units, <clears throat> to name a few of the uh, different assets that were, that were affected by, by the storm. Now, although we have restored heat and hot water to, at all 18 sites. We still have six developments with work in progress. And, and let me just mention that immediately after the storm, we had to install four mobile boilers. Four mobile boilers were, were, were put in place, which is actually still in place today. Um, and as I mentioned, six developments do have work remaining. Uh, and I can name those right now. Uh, more is one of them. Uh, more has a mobile boiler that's supporting that that plant, but the internal work to restore the uh, advanced boiler management system that controlled that that heating plant is still in progress. Uh, 1471 Watson, which is one of our older plants, we got that plant back up and running. It's currently running on oil and supporting the heat and hot water needs of the uh, of that development, but we staged the mobile boiler and we're gonna keep it there because we anticipate that we may have issues with that plant because of the, uh, the water damage. Uh, Sackworn is one of the plants in the Bronx that was also inundated with the stormwater. We got that plant up and running on oil 
and we are still pending the uh, gas restoration to run that plant back on gas. LES5, um, which is in the Lower East Side, small plant with a uh, advanced boiler management system, also has work ongoing, although we, we restored heat and hot water by uh, sistering that plant with a neighboring plant, and that neighboring plant is now supporting two buildings. Uh, that work is also ongoing. We ran into a small hiccup this weekend with a major leak from above that damaged some of the electrical components that the vendor put in just last week. So that's going to set us back a little bit, but the work in that plant is ongoing. Levitt, another older plant, currently on a mobile boiler. Uh, the internal boilers, the work on the internal boilers has not started. What has been completed is the replacement of a gas-fired hot water uh, boiler. Woodside, which is a large plant, probably one of the largest of all the plants that were affected, uh, has two mobile boilers currently uh, supporting the heat and hot water needs. And the work on the internal plant is, is progressing. We've replaced the feed water pumps already, installed new sump pumps, uh, replaced the heat control panels to all the buildings because they were all underwater. And three of the five burners have been replaced in the plant. Um, and we're waiting on DOB to come out and inspect the gas line work so that they can uh, uh, restore those three boilers out of the five uh, back, to, uh, back to gas operation. That concludes my, uh, my presentation. If there are, are any questions, now's the time. Uh Yes, uh, I have the vice chair. Uh, so, hello, Mr. Almodovar. It's good to see you again. Likewise. likewise. How are uh, you? Um, I'm okay. I'm Great. okay. Ready to get back into this. Uh, uh, I just wanted to be clear on a couple of things. Uh, you said that there's 31 mobile boilers, of which 18 are currently installed. And you mentioned two other ones, two rentals that are coming in to effect. So that will make the total up to 33 mobile boilers that you will have at your disposal by the end of the, the by the soon? Yes, yes. Okay, and, and, and those aren't installed as of yet? No, but we have 10 right now on the ready if we need okay. them. Okay, and I'm sorry that I'm asking these questions now. I, my right. iPad is acting a little wonky, so I couldn't get to see this. They sent it beforehand and I couldn't get to see it. The other question is, um, I, I noticed that when you were showing the four examples of the percentages, uh, you have a term hydroderm boilers. Now, could you elaborate, would you elaborate a little bit on that? Sure. Um, so we have two types of, uh, of boilers. One is the conventional, the largest style boilers, which are part of a campus style development. Then we have what's called hydrotherm boilers. These are small packaged boilers uh, that also require overall. A lot easier to do than the conventional boilers, which is why we pretty much get through those rather quickly. Uh, but they're small package boilers. Okay. Okay, and, and, and do you still, in any other developments, have the type of boiler system or the system uh, like we had at WISE once a long time ago where the hot water and the heat are more or less the same system? We have three types of systems. Um, one, like the one at WISE Towers, is a right. uh, hydronic system. That's Hydro where we, we run superheated water through the, uh, through the piping, through the heat distribution piping and through the convector. Then we have a one pipe uh, gravity system, which is what you would see at the brownstones that are also part of, of, of Wasura and, and, and WISE. Okay. And then, then we have the two pipe um, gravity uh, vacuum systems, which are the most that we have, are the two pipe and the hydronic. Those are the most uh, systems that we have. Okay, well, that, that, that takes care of my questions. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank um, you. Good morning. Um, may I call you Javier because I can't pronounce your last That's name? That's fine. Right? That's fine, Mr. Adams. Okay. So I will say that the response time uh, has gotten better. Uh, in my, uh, I see that. I think that's, I believe management has the ability to call these plumbers and, and uh, contractors 
that you have, uh, you know, on speed dial to come help us. That's that has definitely that has gotten better. Uh, but I have a um, a couple of questions. The system that is at my uh, residence and other buildings like it. Uh, can you elaborate? Because uh, I've been told by the gentleman Con Edison when he responded when that that system just literally almost just exploded downstairs, and he explained that the um, steam and how it's uh, pulled in from, I believe, their system into the building or something of that nature. I, I might be not correct with that, but anyway, um, where are where are we at with possibly getting those systems um, uh, update graded? I mean, like not a time frame, but I do understand it that they're going to be replaced and it takes time. Mm -hmm. I do understand that because they do not function at a very well level. And my next question is um, about monitors exterior monitors and in the apartments. With the apartments, when someone calls them have any heat and staff show up, people are trying to heat their apartments with manually with showers, boil water, sometimes burning ovens, which they're not supposed to do. If someone shows up and wants to take a temperature reading based on the heat that the individual has provided for themselves, doesn't that work against them? And um, if so, how can it be a fair assessment of, of this heat that NYCHA is supposed to provide, provide than the individual is supposed to provide for themselves? Last question, the exterior monitors. Now I was outside, I looked at it and the Con Edison guy was there again. And he said, he, don't, he doesn't see an LCD reading on there. And he also showed me that it, the position of it is, which is against the wall where there's warm heating pipes. And you have y'all have made a, um, a, a exit for the steam to come out. So if there's hot steam coming out and the, and that Mars is sitting next to a warm brick, how can the system kick in if it and we get a fair temperature reading to get our boiler kicking in? It just um, did you understand the three questions or did I present them properly? Um, I'll, I'll I'll try. I think so. The first one was um you wanted to know about the system. Well. we'll and how that system works and elaborate a little bit more on the type of system at Sandra Thomas, correct? It's not only my building. We have, you have more systems like this. I don't want to make it about just my building. These systems, I have been told by an administrator, do not function well. And thank goodness y'all were able to put staff <clears throat> into babysit them because it needs to be, it needs to be manually made adjustments so it comes on properly and comes up higher properly. That is the so, issue. So, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure which system the administrator was talking about, but I can tell you that at Sandra Thomas and other systems, other de developments like Sandra Thomas that have what's called a um, high pressure reducing station that supports the steam needs for the building's distribution system. We use that high pressure steam. It comes in at around 180 PSI. Uh, it gets reduced down to low operating pressure, which is between 10 and 15. That's what we operate with. Um, and that 10 and 15 PSI is what supports the heat distribution system on the building end. In the case of Sandra Thomas, it's a hydronic system. So again, it's one of those systems with superheated water that have a pump that, that pump the water through the uh, distribution system to heat up the apartment. Um, I, I don't have an answer as to when the systems are going to be replaced. Uh, that's something that, that I'll have to talk to capital about. I'm not even sure, to be honest, whether it's on the five-year plan or not. Um, I hope that answers the question on, on, on systems. And then you said uh, a fair assessment when the staff comes into the apartment to take apartment temperature reading. The staff, when they come into your apartment, um, they're required not only to take a temperature reading, they're also required to write on the work order whether or not there's an external source to heat up the, uh, the apartment, a stove, boiling water, or whatever it may be that the resident may be, may be using. Of course, we advise the residents not to use the stove because it's unsafe. The other thing that they do when they do these assessments is they look at the equipment. They have to come in and take a look at the radiator or convector to make sure that there's heat emanating from it. If there isn't heat, they have to check the riser uh, if they have access to the riser. If the riser is hot, then they know their problem is that, that that heating element 
and they should do, perform some work on that heating element, whether it's opening the valve, because a lot of times we do, believe it or not, find the valves closed. They open it and restores heat to the, to the convector. Or in the case of a uh, two-pipe vacuum system, which is not the type of system that's in your building, by the way, or in a hydronic building, they replace the, the bimetallic element trap at the end of it. And that usually allows the steam to flow through the, uh, through the convector. In a one-pipe gravity system, they want to make sure that the, that the um, radiator is pitched properly back towards the, the, the steam supply. Because in those systems, you have an air vent that allows air to escape. And once the, the steam hits it, it shuts off and allows the steam to convert back from a vapor to a liquid. And that liquid makes its way out of the system right through the same pipe that it was uh, received. That's why it's important that the pitch is back towards the supply line. And every now and again, they have to replace the air vent because the air vent may not be working and may not be allowing air to escape the, uh, that convector. <laughs> and in a hydronic system, uh, what tends to be a problem, we have these self-bleeders as well. These self-bleeders allow air to release uh, once the pump is running so that you don't cre create a, uh, 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 an issue where the system becomes airbound and the superheated hot water is not flowing steadily. Um, so to conduct a fair assessment, the HPT has to check all these things and also, again, make note whether or not there is uh, an, an external source to heat up the apartment. Now, the weather head that you speak of, um, and that's the, uh, the unit that the, the gentleman from Con Ed said it doesn't show a digital display, he's wrong. Okay, the Javier, digital... Javier, can I interrupt you? I see the chair has his hand up, so I- No, I... let Javier finish. I'll, okay. I can wait, yeah. Okay, all righty. Sorry, Javier. Proceed. He's wrong in, in the sense, that's okay. In the sense that there is a digital display on the heat control panel that's in the basement that controls the heat going into the building. That digital display shows what that weather head is reading. Because it, remember, it works on, on, on air temperature. Um, I'm curious though, to uh, look into what you mentioned with, with us releasing steam into that area. Because that may throw off the, the setting a bit, but we haven't seen that. And by the way, that weather head is fairly new. We, we replaced it uh, end of June, maybe early, early July. So, but, uh, okay, so uh, in response to your answers, uh, to hear that these systems that, I, that at my residence and others, I'm probably not on this five-year plan, is very disappointing to hear because I've been told numerous times that these systems are gauged to possibly be replaced. They do not work. That's why you have staff here from five to two, from two to 10 p.m. And I literally had to annoy or send these multiple emails to make sure that, you know, that we could get that type of help. The second part of this, when they respond to my part, I'm using the example, I asked them to please hold open the thermometers, check the vents. When they restore the heat that I'm entitled to as a resident, they can come back and check the temperature that is provided to get a fair and accurate reading. I've, all these other things that you mentioned, I've never seen them go through that where they write on a slip and, um, and they say, that, and I tell them, I say, listen, you know, I'm boiling everything here. I'm not sure where that happens, but it doesn't happen here. It didn't happen in Patterson when I lived there. It didn't happen in East River. The last part of, of what you were saying, that exterior monitor, is not just so much the steam coming out, it's planted up against a wall where there's hot water pipes. I emailed you the picture back. I emailed you the, uh, the, 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 the inquiry about that and um, about the, um, the, the last two parts of the, my question. But to hear that these systems are not going to be replaced when it literally, last heating season, exploded. If the HPT had responded 10 minutes earlier, it might not have been a good situation. They are not functioning well. They do not function well. And thanks to well, whoever, Greg, or whoever got us help there, we have some heat now. And that's basically it. Okay. So uh, the, I'm going to lower my hand. Um, okay, thank you. So uh, I, the, I wanted to say my remarks for Javier's presentation because I think it's important 
to understand sort of the uh, hill we have to climb here. First, with respect to any heating system that he's currently maintaining, other than ones where we have done sort of major replacements or rebuilds, and there is a schedule, uh, both using state money and city money, to do some of the uh, larger uh, boiler systems. Those are in the works. But the rest of the portfolio needs capital. The reason uh, you can't go into the building and replace what's there is there's no money to do so. That even with the additional money we have, we identified boiler systems to get the state money. We have a list of what we're spending that money on for the city as well. And those are all um, uh, uh, laid out uh, for the resources available. And on top of that, particularly for the state funding, we have to add additional federal money because it's incredibly expensive to deal with these systems. So the capital plans that we have use the capital money that's available, but this is one of the things where we created the blueprint originally a, a couple years ago to raise that money. We're now waiting on Washington to determine if they're going to put public housing capital money into the Build Back Better bill. And if they do, that first uh, slug of money is going to go for comprehensive rehabilitation at three of the larger sites. If that bill passes, and we don't know that it will, the bill will inject $10 billion into the public housing system nationwide. About $2 billion will come to NYCHA, and that will go to service the comprehensive rehabilitation, that's all building systems, all units at three properties. Now that gives you a sense of the scale of the need. The second thing I wanna point out is uh, what John said at the introduction. If you go into some of these boiler rooms, we, even with the technology that we've added, we're basically operating a steam engine and the technology hasn't sufficiently advanced beyond that. Um, even when Con, he Con Ed provides the steam, which I believe is the case in uh, uh, Member Adams's building, um, these systems uh, are now really antiquated and outdated. They do not line up with the direction that the country seems to be going with respect to energy and options for technologies around energy. That means that when we do this, we want to make a building that has unit or building-based systems and that too is going to require additional capital. So the idea that we have sort of this sort of resource, it's not there. Now it may be there in the future when Congress decides to appropriate it or we can leverage funds, but it is not there now. And I just want to stress that. The last thing I wanted to say, Ida pointed out something else that we're going to have to deal with. That is, in the, in the Ida storm, so much water came down on the city. Uh, it's like a 300 year flood event or whatever the term is. What does that mean? That means that we have to either put sump pumps of substantial size, regrade buildings to prevent drainage into the building, which is a substantial site work, backflow valve preventers on any kind of storm drain or sanitary lines, because those uh, flood as well, and then that water rises up into the basement. The other thing that Ida pointed out is we have to do this at every property we own. And that includes changing the configurations of our systems, protecting any electronics from flooding, moving systems above ground or to the roof or changing systems so that we don't have to do that, and providing emergency generators and backup for pumps and things that we would need. That is money that is also capital dependent. And when Javier went through his list of, of damaged items from the storm, um, we had to pull that money out of regular operations or, or capital sources because it wasn't funded. Now we may get reimbursed by insurance, we may get FEMA money, that's great. But this points out how much capital is actually needed to affect the kind of changes that the board member was asking about. And we have um, an enormous capital deficit in the heat plant operation. 
we have technologies that while uh, serviceable are not ideal by any stretch of the imagination. And until we get that kind of capital money and can get on a schedule, um, we are not going to be able to do uh, the comprehensive reconstruction of these buildings that's required. I, I can't emphasize that enough uh, to the public, to the board. Um, we are servicing systems where the technology was designed in the 1890s in some cases. That's where this technology comes from. And uh, until we are able to replace or significantly upgrade and we get the capital to do that, Javier's department uh, is gonna have to, has to hold that together. Um, it's not a secret, it's not a mystery. It's a lack of capitalization over 60 years. And here is where we are. So we will keep our eye on what's happening in Washington. But I have to say, we are now in December. We think the bill will pass, but we don't know. It's great to wait on Washington because in theory, they're gonna provide a lot of money. But um, we'll be back to the board for discussion if that money is shorter than we anticipated or doesn't happen because we're gonna to have to do something else. And um, I can't emphasize this enough. These buildings run on technology. We're making the parts, as I've said before, for some of this technology. These boilers were installed when I was a child. That's a long time ago and <laughs> even before. And I, I, there's only one way out. The one way out is to fund the damn thing. And uh, that's true for every single property where we have old systems. And I wanna commend um, the heating crews uh, for keeping these things working, for making the parts, for getting the supplies. But it's, it's, I think the introduction is, is a cautionary note. Um, and I just wanted to add that because I really think it's important for all of us to understand there's only one path out of what we're experiencing. And that is uh, the reinvestment and upgrades in technology, whether they be new boiler systems, new heating plants, whether it's heat pumps, whether it's electrification, um, better insulation, all of that uh, is going to depend on us securing the capital before we can make a turn uh, on the kinds of things that are in front of us today. Uh, Greg, uh, the, the number from Washington, I believe, I could be wrong, is going to be higher than $2 billion. Chuck Schumer is going to bat with two bats, two baseballs, to make NYCHA a priority in more money than that. that, that, that in, so well, let me finish. Let me finish. In the meantime, while we have these systems that take time to replace, and I truly understand this, as Javier stated, one of the biggest assets is personnel. And as Ms. Koch related two years ago, personnel is key in situations like this where you have antiquated equipment that just needs to be kickstarted. So in the meantime, assured we can just have what you are able to secure here, I guess other facilities as well, is to have staff here to babysit it, kickstart it when it's needed because we can't have suffrage. That's just impossible. Waiting well, I, I don't disagree. Uh, no, I'm just saying. Joe, we, uh, but but, we, but I, 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 I do want to point out something. In the Build Back Better bill, there's three um, areas of funding. There's the $10 billion that comes automatically by formula. Then there's a, a, a another set aside of money for a program called Choice Neighborhoods. Then there's the balance of the money. Now, the balance of the money is unspecified as to how it will be distributed. It gives the secretary the authority. She gets the authority to create grants for priority projects, which include some of the things that are priorities for NYCHA. So... Um, this is not going to come in um, all at once to us to be able to use immediately. So there is going to be a lag between the time that bill passes, if it passes, and the larger grant funds beyond the $2 billion that I mentioned. The $2 billion is supposed to drop 60 days after the bill is signed by the president. Great. But in order to treat the entire portfolio, our position has been we need to do comprehensive modernization, including the heating systems. The scale of the need is such that the best we could do with that 2 billion is three properties, which is fine. That's great. 
But the rest of the money is going to come to us through some kind of other method that HUD's going to establish, other grant programs, applications that have to be put in. So while we appreciate the work that our delegation is doing, the way the bill is drafted now is not simply going to hand, hand NYCHA $40 billion. Uh, we'll get the two, and then we're going to have another process to get the rest. So that's how the, the, the bill that left the House looks. That could get changed in the Senate. Um, but it's going to take some time. To the second point, the operating budget, which we're going to be obliged to present, is under tremendous pressure at the moment. And there's two, two reasons for that. One, we're losing income because people have stopped paying rent. We're collecting about 74% of the rent now. That's an enormous hit. And secondly, our costs are going up to do the kinds of things that you described. So um, every single person has, um, uh, every single uh, person we fund through the operating budget, um, we've got to pay for that. And when you add the compliance costs and the increase in compliance, which is welcome, I'm just saying that um, we have um, a fragile moment that we're going to have to get through. And that while it's great to have the staff there, I'm not going to represent to any board member or the public that that's going to be possible all the time because we don't have the funding for that kind of staffing. I'm confused. So with this, this is going to be sustained suffrage? I mean, I, Joe, I, it, it, the idea is to make sure no one's without heat. But what I'm saying is that um, we have pressures on both budgets, both the operating budget, uh, which funds Javier's staff, and the capital budget, which we're waiting for in income or a bill from Washington. So until then, we have the resources that we have. Now, to your point earlier, we have been able to address um, by having heating plant technicians on a shift schedule for buildings like yours. Um, but I don't want to represent that we, we, we have a, sort of a carte blanche to do that. That has to be balanced with all the other compliance needs under the HUD agreement as well. So um, no one's suggesting that we're trying to diminish resources. What we're trying to do is figure our way through the resources we have. And um, I consider the operating budget and the capital budgets at this time to uh, both be fragile. And if we get the money from Washington, great. If we get additional operating subsidy from HUD, fantastic, we can spend it. Um, but one of the things we have to deal with now is this drop in rent collections, which is quite severe. And next, uh, when we do the presentations for the budget, we're gonna talk a lot about what that means. So the board has a full understanding of where that places us when we bring the budget to you in uh, December. Understood. It's just uh, very sad to hear this, that um, we only have six months or so out of the year that we actually need help like that until this money mm -hmm. comes. So I'm not, I'm a little perplexed about uh, how, because um, I did have a meeting with Javier and the general manager a while back, and I was not like promised, but it was assured that they understood that the staffing would have to be in place to have these systems work properly and also to deploy the staff to other areas if needed. We cannot suffer like that. It's just not a feasible option. Money well, aside. I'm not too, well, I'm sorry, go ahead. But money aside, I understand that equipment takes time to replace, takes time to fix. But we need personnel at not only my development and others to just kickstart it. And if they're needed to go someplace else, nearby buildings, it's, it's a, it's a win-win situation until other help arrives. Well, that's, that's I, I think want. Javier has put that in place. Okay, but well, I but, understood him then. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I, I know. I think Javier's got, got folks that are looking and not at your property, but others. That's right. But yeah. I, I just want to call out that, um, you know, uh, uh, that, that kind of notion, that's great. I'm glad it's there. But I also want to uh, indicate that um, every time we think of a staffing solution, we have to think of a way to pay for it. So um, I'll let it go back to Javier. Javier, what do you have now for HPTs with respect to that? How does that work? 
Do you mean total headcount? Or? No, just at, at the properties I, I uh, that you've got, you know, uh, the board member's property is part of a Right, it's part of seven group. other yeah. seven other consolidations. We have an AM and PM watch every single day that come in. They uh, After they punch in over at um, the hostess, they walk over to Sandra Thomas, make sure that everything is working, and move on and do the uh, rest of the checks at that location. But there's seven other sites that they have to look at, three and of I which have, are boiler rooms, by the way. I Sandra Thomas is not a boiler room. I have seen them. They they are here. I've seen right. them. Thank you. Oh, good. You're welcome. But I do I do want to um go on the record and say one thing. Um, um, we have not experienced an explosion at any of our high pressure steam sites. What we have had are steam leaks. Some on the high pressure side, and some on the low. Um, and when it's on the high pressure side, it it lets out a lot of steam. But we have not had an explosion. Well, the fire department, Con Edison, and some other emergency team responded to the situation here. They used the term uh, uh, low pressure steam. Uh, ex, 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 uh, what do you call when steam burst out like that? Maybe not explosion. Maybe the term I'm using is too hard, but there was something wrong. And that steam. Maybe a blown the, gasket? A blown gasket? Well, well the steam came out. Right. And as the administrator at NYCHA came by and stated, that he has to send special people here for these type of systems. Mm -hmm. It's not just your typical system. And it's very, very, um, not dangerous, but very tedious and has to be treated a certain way. That's what he said. Well, we have high pressure steam plumbers that are trained on how to work on the equipment. Yeah, I've seen them too, yes. Yeah. They, they, right. they are the ones that are assigned to that type of equipment when we have uh, a steam leak on the equipment. Okay, well, okay. that's that's it from my, my perspective on it. You know, yeah. uh, that's yeah. it. I'm uh, I just have one. Uh, I'm sorry, just um, board member Adam. You you done? Yes. Oh, I just have one general question for you. This is Vice Chair. Uh, in in the other systems elsewhere, where the residents know where the valves are in the apartment, are there any ramifications to the rest of the development or the rest of the building when they start teetering with that valve? That, that is a very good question. And the answer to that is yes and no. No, because on the, remember I said I have, we have three types of system. Right. No on the two pipe steam gravity vacuum systems and no right. on the one pipe uh, gravity systems. Because if you shut the valve at your convector, you're only isolating your convector. But in a hydronic system, uh, which is the type we have at, at, at Weiss Towers and right. at Sandra Thomas and some other some of our other um, senior buildings. If you shut the valve in your apartment, you can affect the entire loop on that floor because these systems, these hydronic systems work with a pump in the basement. They pump water through all of these different loops. There's a, uh, a horizontal loop, loop in the basement, which then feeds vertical loops, which then feed horizontal loops on each floor and those loops are exactly that they're a loop they supply and they return and if you shut the valve on the beginning of the loop it'll affect that entire loop and i'm sorry i'm using my hands but i just i'm hoping that you can see what i'm doing creating yeah. the sign yeah, of a loop yeah, I, I, so yeah. so yes in in the hydronic system it can affect the heat on the rest of that loop okay Okay, I was just curious because uh, I've I've seen or heard this happen, and and then it, it seems like it's a major problem. Uh, although I was under the impression that it may not only cause problems at at the same on the same floor, uh, I it's or it apparent it, it seemed that it also affected some of the upper floors as well. Uh, I don't know if that's ever the case, but then again, you don't know. I don't know enough about the steam systems themselves to be accurate. But thank you. I got the I got the message then. You're welcome. It all depends on where that leak that that loop goes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Paula, you have your hand up. 
Yes, I did. Thank you so much. And I appreciate the hard work that goes into this particular area. My question has to do with communications. Um, when heat is out at a building, how do residents know the status and the, um, the forecast for when it'll be restored? So, <clears throat> excuse me, when, when there's a service disruption, heat or hot water in a building, and we create a, uh, a heat outage, what happens within the hour of that outage created, a robocall goes out to the affected residents. Uh, letting them know that there is a service disruption in this case is, would be heat or hot water and that NYCHA is working on the, uh, the problem. Our goal, of course, is to get that restored as quickly as possible. But for whatever reason, if it goes into, say, 10 to 12 hours, a second robocall goes out to the residents letting them know that we're still here working on it. Um, but the minute that it is restored and the work is completed, a robocall again goes out to the residents, letting them know that the service has been restored. And this time um, it asks the resident or it lets the resident know uh, that if they still have a condition that's, a, that's in their apartment related to, to, in this case, heat or hot water, to please uh, con press, I believe it's press um, star or eight, I forget what it is. It asks you to press and it immediately transfers your call to the uh, CCC so that you can make a work order for that for that issue. In addition to that, the staff is required to post the, the lobby when something like that happens. Now, that's what I just explained is, is, is related to an unplanned incident. We do have planned service disruptions where we take the systems down to perform a, a preventative maintenance or a repair that we identified previously that we temporarily corrected to maintain services uh, and we're taking it down so that we can finalize that, that repair. And when that happens, um, the outage of course is created in advance, the outage work order, and the robocall goes out to the effective residents 48 hours in advance. And then it goes out again the morning of the actual uh, scheduled service disruption. Thanks. Um, you know, it's still the, after the 10 to 12 hours, if something is still out, how, what do I do to find out the, the prospects for resolution? I'm a resident. Just, I'm, I'm asking as a resident, what would I do? Well, normally what, what we do is we also communicate with the uh, resident association. The resident can call the, um, the resident leader because we keep in contact with the resident leader, letting them know what's going on and, and, and we, we, we give them progress when things uh, start to take a turn for the worse. They can do that or they can call the, the, the CCC to try to find out or they can go right on the, the, the website. We have the okay. uh, service interruption website that right there tells you what the progress of that service disruption is. It gives you the current right. status of it. Great, and I, you know, I, I want to be, you know, rec recognize that you don't necessarily know when it's going to be restored, but communications become so critical, and so I think these are all good steps. So thanks. Very welcome. <clears throat> yes. Uh, thank you, everyone. If there are no further questions, thank you, John, Javier, um, Chair. And, and board members for those great questions. Um, we'll now proceed to calendar items one through 23. Um, Patty's up first, followed by Razul, by Kerry, and then Steve. I am going to enlist the um, assistance of the co-host to please mute anyone um, that's causing um, background interference so that we can proceed um, efficiently uh, with these items as it's almost 11 a.m. Item one, Patty. Good morning, everyone. My name is Patty Bayros, and I'm the CIO at the New York City Housing Authority. Thanks very much for your time today. And I'll be presenting item number one for your consideration, which pertains to our use of Oracle-based systems. This item is for a request for approval to enter into an agreement with Mythics Incorporated, a software reseller of Oracle products. For contract year of one term, beginning on 12 
contract term of one year beginning on 12-31-2021 for an amount not to exceed $1,553,898.40. NYCHA's IT team manages and supports many business critical applications for business use, such as Siebel, Maximo, Oracle Financials, and our data warehouse, all of which have some Oracle components for which we require software license maintenance. This agreement provides for that software maintenance, and there, it is critical for NYCHA to maintain products with the recommended support levels and provide support to business applications and databases that utilize Oracle products. These very products are the things that are used throughout the authority to support our residents uh, to manage our developments. I'm happy to take any questions. Yes, um, Patty, good morning. Um, mm -hmm. I got your response, or the response that was given um, to me, I'm not sure if it came from you. And I had asked that it be elaborated that how would the services affect the day-to-day -day, uh, lives of the people of, of us living and the people working here. Uh, the response that was sent was sort of a re uh, a refurbished part of the, of the original resolution. Now you did mention something about maintenance. You didn't elaborate, it wasn't elaborate how the service would help maintenance. I have an idea personally, but um, it just talked about procurement and services and uh, briefly managed, but it didn't, it didn't, it did not state how it would affect the people to do work, maybe one or two examples of how that would, how having the services um, being provided by this, this um, vendor make things better. Mm -hmm. And it did not provide how the residents may be going to a management office and say their system is down, they can't fax, they can't scan or do things. I'm, I, there was nothing like that explained in your explanation how it was gonna make things better. So, I, read um, it, so I, read, I read through it twice. Okay. I asked specific how it was so gonna if, make if, better. if I could, uh, uh, board member, um, this is software that connects other softwares. And those other softwares face outward either to staff or to residents. So this is part of a, um, I'd say foundation piece so that the outward facing softwares can function the way they're supposed to function. Um, and that support chain is how it impacts both staff and residents in my reading. Yes, and I'll just, that's exactly right. Essentially, board member Adams, uh, we would not have our, our civil self-service platform. Uh, the CCC would not be able to um, take and log the calls. This Oracle um, software is the basis for all of the front end systems that are used by our staff and residents today. <laughs> So however our work order system is helping residents, however our call center is helping residents, um, the self-service portal, the kiosks, all of those things, um, the Oracle software on the back end behind the scenes is what makes those run. Um, so that, that's why it is necessary. Okay, and okay. saying that, the question that was put forth for my response, and I see that Greg explained that, but um, example, uh, during the last inspection period, maintenance at six developments, the handheld devices couldn't generate a follow-up ticket that had to be done two days later. I'm not blaming Oracle. What I'm saying is you're presenting for some, for service to be used that would make things better. That's one example. I'm not going to top this meeting with many examples. The question was just not specifically more general how it may be with one, maybe two, maybe three examples how it would make things better. So evidently, whoever gave the response to you did not know that if the maintenance people come here to do inspection and the handheld can't generate tickets, that's an inconvenience. That's just one. I'm just saying. So the, the question that I asked, it just didn't, you know what, let's just move on. I, <laughs> okay, before okay. we move on, Member Adams, I just want to add that the... Um, the items themselves were um, amended to include specifically payment transactions to vendors and suppliers and processing purchases for goods and services, which obviously benefit directly uh, the residents. Um, additionally, the software works together to keep 
end users applications operational, including Maximo for issuing and completing work orders that was added for managing resident information and correspondence that was added for data warehouse for information sharing that was added. So those were what, the specific things uh, that were right, added what, to the what, item. Well, thank you, because I, I, I missed those points unless, I, unless it was, uh, no, I, it was if it was in a, okay, well, so that is a very profound explanation of how it's going to make services better. All due respect, I might have missed those points when I read it. And yes, you, you did. Uh, we can just move on then. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Patty. Um, item two, Razul. Yeah, good morning. Uh, my name is Rasul Azanjad. I'm the vice president of Healthy Home. Uh, item number two, authorization is requested to amend the board resolution 19-10-30-30, which authorized a sole related to ventilation contract and other contract related to mold detection, inspection, and remediation administrated by Authority Capital Project Division, Operation Department, or Healthy Home collectively ventilation and mold contract to temporarily suspend the prerequisite authority approval of contract that are valued in excess of $1 million as required by law and change order and funding increase as required by law. Uh, this temporary suspension is, is to extend the temporary suspension of additional 730 days. The initial 730 days temporary suspension commenced in October 30th, 2019 and continued through October 29, 2021. Supply management and procurement department has confirmed no contract was awarded or change order or contract capacity increase entered into during the lapse temporary suspension coverage from October 29, 2021 to November 29, 2021. The approval to extend this temporary suspension for additional 730 days was received by supply management and procurement department from chief procurement officer in November 18, 2021. All other terms and conditions set forth in board resolution 19-10-30-30 shall remain unchanged. Any question? Okay. No questions, but I do want to add for the record that funding increases are now known as contract capacity increases for the record. Thank you, Razul. Thank Items you. three through 11, Carrie. Good morning. I'm Carrie Jew, Chief Administrative Officer. Um, I apologize, I'm having some trouble turning my video on. Um, so I will just continue. Um, this morning, I'm presenting board resolutions three through 11 with these. Um, so I'll take three through 10 first with these eight resolutions. I'm seeking authorization to enter into agreements with eight firms to provide general professional and IT staff augmentation services. These services were procured via a request for proposal, which was published on May 7th, 2021, and was advertised in the city record on the authority's website. Prospective proposers were invited to attend a pre-submission conference on May 17th, 2021, and to submit questions concerning the RFP via email to the supply management and procurement department by May 21st, 2021. Responses were posted May 28th, 2021, and, on, and they were posted on the authority's website. The submission deadline was June 9th, 2021. 279 firms viewed the solicitation online, 30 firms submitted proposals by the deadline, and 18 of the proposals were deemed responsive. 12 of the proposals were deemed non-responsive due to not satisfying document completeness or minimum qualification requirements, or not following the specific cost proposal submission as submitted as stipulated by the RFP. An evaluation committee comprised of representatives from the IT general services, human resources and administration departments reviewed the 18 proposals. Based on the ratings of the proposals by the RFP evaluation committee, the administration department recommends that the authority enter into eight agreements for staff augmentation services with Cogent, Disk Writer, Infogenie, IT Trailblazers, Prutech, Software People, UCI, and TSCTI. 
with board resolution number three, I'm requesting authorization to enter into an agreement with disc writer for an amount not to exceed $12 million. With board resolution number four, I'm requesting authorization to enter into an agreement with InfoGenie for an amount not to exceed $25 million. With board resolution number five, I'm requesting authorization to enter into an agreement with IT Trailblazers for an amount not to exceed $45 million. With board resolution number six, I'm requesting authorization to enter into an agreement with Cogent for an amount not to exceed $20 million. With board resolution number seven, I am requesting authorization to enter into agreement with Prutec for an amount not to exceed $15 million. With board resolution number eight, I am requesting authorization to enter into agreement with Software People for an amount not to exceed $10 million. With board resolution number nine, I'm requesting authorization to enter into an agreement with TSCTI for an amount not to exceed $10 million. All eight agreements will commence January 1st, 2022 and can continue for five years thereafter. The term for each agreement includes the initial term of three years with two one-year renewal options to be renewed automatically unless the authority at its sole discretion provides written notice of its intent not to re renew prior to the expiration of the expiring term. The total not to exceed amount for all eight agreements is $148 million. These agreements will provide the authority with staff augmentation services for the recruitment of temporary employees on an as needed basis. The temporary employees will be used when a specific skill set is required and existing authority staff cannot perform the work. By way of background, on November 20, in November 2018, NYCHA engaged seven vendors for staff augmentation services, including Cogent, DiscWriter, InfoGenie, and IT Trailblazers. Since the adoption of these 2018 agreements, unforeseen business requests for projects related to pre-emerging, to, to re-emerging regulatory requirements, critical business initiatives, and the authority's transformation plan have significantly increased the need for skilled technical, analytical, and clerical temporary staff as provided by the eight staff augmentation vendors. Therefore, I'm requesting your approval to fund the provision of services with Cogent, DiscWriter, InfoGenie, IT Trailblazers, Prutec, Software People, UCI, TSCTI, for five years, which includes two one-year renewal options for a total of $148 million. Any questions? Yes, Carrie, it's Greg. Uh, yeah. These, we're really just saying these are not to exceed amounts, um, you know, as needed over the period of time so that um, everyone, we're, we're not obligated to spend up to that unless, you know, Oh, absolutely. No, right. No, right. No one's right. I know, I know. <laughs> when you see a big number like that, yeah. I just want yes. folks to understand these are these are maximum caps and so forth. And um, we can choose among these vendors depending on what we need. Um, but we're putting this in place so we have the services available over several years. Correct. Correct. Great. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. Sure. I also got to commend you on the Section 3 hiring. Oh, well, nice, nice, sizable amount. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Gonzalez. Okay, with that, I'm going to take us to Board Resolution Number 11. With this resolution, I am seeking authorization to ratify entering into an agreement with Trigen Technologies Incorporated for general professional and IT staff augmentation services. These services were procured via request for proposal, which was published on May 7, 2021 and advertised in the city record on the authorities and on the authorities website. Prospective proposers were invited to attend a pre-submission conference on May 17, 2021 and to submit questions concerning the RFP via email to the Supply Management and Procurement Department by May 21, 2021. Responses were posted May 28, 2021 and on, on the authority's website. The submission deadline was June 9, 2021. 279 firms viewed the solicitation online, 30 firms submitted proposals by the deadline, and 18 of the proposals were deemed responsive. 12 of the proposals were deemed non-responsive due to not satisfying document completeness or minimum qualification requirements, or not following the specific cost proposal submission as stipulated in the RFP. 
an evaluation committee comprised of representatives from the IT, general services, human resources, and administration departments reviewed the 18 proposals. Based on the ratings of the proposals by the RFP evaluation committee, the human resources department recommended that the authority enter into an agreement with Trigen for staff augmentation services. NYCHA's agreement commenced on September 1st, 2021 for an initial three-year term with two one-year renewal, renewal options to be renewed automatically at the authority's sole discretion. The not to exceed amount of this contract is $50 million. The agreement provides the authority with staff augmentation services for the recruitment of temporary employees on an as-needed basis. These temporary employees will be used when a specific skill set is required and existing authority staff cannot perform the work. To provide some background, in November 2013, NYCHA entered into a three-year contract with two one-year renewal options with Trigen for staff augmentation services. In 2018, the board approved the execution of another five-year agreement with Trigen to provide staff augmentation services for an amount not to exceed $18 million. In July 2019, the board approved an amendment to the agreement to increase the not to exceed amount by $18 million in order to fund Trigen's continued provision of services. Since the adoption of the 2018 agreement with Trigen and subsequent amendment, unforeseen requests for business projects related to the re-emerging regulatory requirements, critical business initiatives, and the authority's transformation plan have significantly increased the need for skilled technical, analytical, and clerical temporary staff as provided by Trigen. Therefore, I'm requesting your approval to fund the provision of services with Trigen for five years, which includes two one-year renewal options for a total of $50 million. Any questions? Okay, no questions. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you, Carrie. Um, items 12 through 23, Steve. Good morning. My name is Stephen Lovesey, okay. Executive Vice President of Capital Projects Division, and we are presenting board items number 12 through 23. Board item number 12. Capital Projects Division seeks authorization to award this contract to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, JNN Construction Group Corp., for the roofing replacement and rooftop renovation at Brownsville Houses in the amount of $43,829,254.01. Uh, JNN uh, has been in operation since 2010 and has had contracts as a prime contractor with the housing authority. They currently have a very good performance evaluation of an 86.07. There was a vendor name check dated September 29th, 2021 and was vetted, um, which found no issues to preclude this award. The variance above the cost estimate is 10.41% and JNN is uh, proposing five section three hires. If there are no questions with board item number 12, I will move on to board item number 13. Um, Steve, I, I do just wanna make a comment that the, um, I think an email was sent earlier, the section three hires, the text, was amended. You said five. It's now says approved under HUD new rule labor hours. So, okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Board item number 13, Capital Projects Division seeks authorization to award the contract to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder. Also JNN Construction Group Corp for roofing replacement and rooftop structure. This is at Nordstrom Houses and is in the amount of $31,886,598.90. Um, there is a, a variance of about 15.61 between JNN's bid and our consultant's cost estimate. Um, through the post-bid meetings, we determined that the variance is attributed to some higher costs for concrete masonry repairs, labor, and materials due to current market conditions, um, but we feel that this bid is still acceptable. Um, as I mentioned before, they have a good rating with us and have done work for the authority in the past. So uh, the award is 
$31,886,598.90. That is 15.61 above our original cost estimate. They too have uh, been vetted by and have a VNC. If there are no further questions on board item number 13, I will move on to board item number 14. Capital Projects Division seeks authorization to award the contract to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, TR Pipe Inc., for the replacement of underground steam systems and condensate lines at Sotomayor houses. This is in the amount of $18,782,700. The first lowest bidder, Welkin Mechanical LLC, was deemed non responsive for failure to submit the required signed letters of assent for its subcontractors as outlined in the authority's bid documents. There is a minus 29.51 variance between TR Pipe's bid and our consultant's cost estimate. That means that their bid was below our cost estimate by 29.51. Uh, we reviewed all of the items uh, with the consultant and uh, we feel based on the analysis that this is an acceptable bid. Uh, TR Pipe has been in operation since 2000 and has done work for the Housing Authority in the past. They have a very good performance evaluation of 93.43. Again, uh, they have a, a variance that is minus 29.51, um, and their award bid was $18,782,700. If there are no further questions on board item number 14, I will move on to board items number 15, 16, 17, and 18. Capital Projects Division seeks authorization for the award of four IDIQ or infinite delivery in indefinite quantity job order contracts for environmental hazard remediation at various developments citywide. Um, Contractors competitively bid with an adjusted factor bid based on pre-established prices in the job order contract construction task catalog. CPD estimated bid factor for these IDIQs was a roughly around 1.40. Um, and each of them um, had a bid factor um, uh, two of them had a bid factor of 1.3 and the other uh, had a bid factor of 1.6. So of the, um, uh, the four, a job order contractor um, as per the bid contracts can only receive two in a series. And so to summarize, CPD is requesting authorization to award two contractors to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder and two contractors to the second lowest responsible and responsible uh, responsive bidder. The board items 15 and 16 would go to New York Environmental Systems Inc, who was the lowest responsive and responsible bidder for all four of the IDIQ job order contracts in the environmental hazard remediation series. Um, as I stated, a job order contractor can only have two uh, contracts in this. So we are requesting for the second lowest responsive and responsible bidder, Maven Construction Corp to receive uh, board items number 17 and 18. Um, these are a not to exceed number of 10 million. So for board item number 15, contract number 21130698, uh, would go to New York Environmental Systems with a bid factor of 1.4. This is a minus 6.57 or below our bid factor. Board item number 16, contract number 2113118 would go to environmental hazard remediation, uh, for re environmental re hazard re remediation, pardon me, it's to New York Environmental Systems Inc. Both 15 and 16 are to New York Environmental Systems Inc. Uh, that was a minus 6.57 variance uh, a bid, um, from our bid factor. 
board items number 17 and 18. 17 is contract number 2113579. And item number 18 is contract number 2113580. Those would go to Mar um, Maven Construction Corp uh, with a bid factor of 14.29. If there are no questions in regards to board items number 15, 16, 17, and 18, I will move on to board item 19, 20, and 21. Okay, proceed. Capital Projects Division seeks authorization to ratify a contract capacity increase to three IDIQ job order contracts for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems work. These ratifications of contract capacity increases are being presented to the board because their value exceeds 10% of the original value. Um, all three IDIQ original contracts had a not to exceed number of $7 million. All three IDIQs have no prior contract increase and all three um, we are requested, we are, uh, we ratified 5 million each for a total of 12 million each. The three contractors, um, Contract number HE1908420. This was WDF Inc. It was original 7 million, increased to five for a total revised award amount of 12 million. Contract HE2200633131 was AWL Industries. Original contract was 7 million, uh, increased capacity of 5 million to a total of a revised amount of 12 million. And finally, HE2006333, also AW Industries, original 7 million uh, amount of contract increase was 5 million and a revised amount of 12 million. Um, Steve? Yes, board uh, member Adams. The, the res response, so I, don't, I can't pull it back up on the screen while we're on a meeting. The response that you sent was for what which was for which company again? Um, so you had asked um, if we could receive a letter from AWL, the, or email. You yeah, go ahead. Yep, yep. We received that letter. They did not specifically indicate the PRV heating system at Thompson Apartments uh, as you had requested. So we submitted the letter that they received. We immediately reached out to them. Um, they've done a number of PRV projects uh, for some hospitals around the city, as well as other um, agencies. And so they were going to edit their letter and put those into that due to the Thanksgiving holiday. They were unable to do that on Thursday and Friday. Um, we, are, we expected to get that this morning. We have not gotten that updated letter, but I have spoken to the principal of the firm. Um, AWL, we, what was what item again? I, which one did they have? Yep, yeah, they had two, they had, um, I'm so, sorry, they had um, two of the contracts, board items number 20 and 21. Okay, so basically uh, they, 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 they didn't respond and I think the corporate secretary had, you know, um, had mentioned that we were going into holiday and that, you know, would be helpful. Okay. And just an email, I mean, we, we bet on that money, just an email stating that it's we're just in the capacity of them to fix systems like the one that you came here with a team of people examined and deemed that there was issues here. Could they fix, is it, is it in the scope of work? That they can fix systems like this, and that they, they just did not respond. I mean, other other. I mean, we got response, you know, responses over the holidays. I don't know what the issue was with them, but to hand them twelve million dollars not to get an email and no response, it's just not really good business, in my so, perspective. So, member member Adams, I just want to um, state that there was a letter dated November twenty fourth. However, it was not distributed to the board because it was not responsive with respect to what you specifically requested, That's the ability to perform work on steam compression systems. So we do not have that specific response. We do have a general response. Um, no, that's not what I asked them. But okay, let's, correct. We can, we, 
we can that move is on. right. That is why yeah. I know Steve is referring to a letter, but I wanted to explain why it was not included in the response that I sent to the board members because it was not responsive. It, it, okay. well, it, it is their response. Okay. It okay. Didn't That's it. Thank you. We can move on, Steve. All right. Uh, I just have uh, something, uh, Steve, with just a, I guess, a general question. When, when it comes to variances, okay, is there a number that's generally accepted or is it based on the scope of work or other mitigating circumstances? What is too high or what is too low? That's a very, very good question. Um, we, uh, we look over, you know, we're, we're fairly comfortable with the estimates that we put out. Um, we use consultants as well as in-house and we you know, monitor the market and know where we're seeing increases and where we're seeing decreases. Usually after a bid comes in, um, if that bid is lower than we anticipate or higher than we anticipate, then we will reach out to that contractor and go through the line items associated to that contractor and see where our numbers are high, where our numbers are low, and why those numbers are high or low. They provide us with additional back, backup um, and conversation, and then we evaluate that. If we feel, um, if the professionals feel that uh, those numbers are considerably high in, based on the current uh, market, as well as if the dollar amount that we have for this and the contingency that we have for that project, those numbers go uh, beyond that, then is when we'll decide that, you know, that, that percentage is too high. Um, the same goes for a percentage being too low from our cost estimate. We want to make sure that the contractor will be able to perform the work. And if that estimate is considerably lower than our estimate, if their bid is considerably lower than our estimate, we're also going to go through and find out which of the line items that they have identified to make sure that they haven't missed something, uh, or if there is a, um, a concern with the, the labor force that they're providing. Um, they may have a lower number because they're going to provide less labor for it, and that might extend the schedule. And so we analyze those bid by bid. Okay. So basically, it, it, it all depends on the circumstances and, and the market, basically. Whereas you can have one bid today that may be 10, and tomorrow you'll have one that's 11, but the one that's 11, you can justify by the other circumstances within the bid. And then the one that's 10, even though it's lower, we won't be able to work with them. Is that basically a general consensus of what you said? Um, it depends on, uh, uh, the number could be high or it could be lower, but it depends on other circumstances. So one bit that I'm just trying to use. Yes, I understand bit. what you're yeah. saying. Well, okay, yeah, so and, it, and, we, and we want to verify that specific bid. So each bid that we receive, we do an analysis of and you're absolutely right. Within the board briefings, uh, the, the board's uh, items that we're presenting today, there are some that were above our right. bid and there were some that were below our bid. We are accepting right. uh, both of those. There is a couple that I will get to that we're gonna reject. They were considerably higher than what we deem acceptable for the current industry and the okay. current market. And so we rejected those. Okay. Yeah, okay, I got it. There's no clear cut number. It just, it, there's too many factors based based on the final decision. Okay, I got we it. We don't have a litmus test of saying, okay, here's the line and we're, right. we're not going it. to accept you above that line or below that line. Okay. Okay, I just want to add as a general rule, my, uh, Vice Chair, that if the variance is below or over 15%, then there must be an explanation in the item. I just wanted to add that um, and okay. Steve, if there's no further questions. On I'm, sorry, items, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I just wanted I'm, to 
Okay, uh, please. Uh, I have yeah. a board member that needs to, um, well, he might have signed off already, but could you just continue? Uh, I think member Gawalb left. I wanted to get to him before voting, but you can proceed. Steve. Steve? Um, yes. Proceed. So, okay. Uh, thank you, Jacqueline. Board mm -hmm. item number 22. Capital Projects Division seeks authorization to reject all bids for a contract for the community center addition at Wyckoff Gardens. Capital received, um, or NYCHA received two bids um, with this contract. The first lowest bidder, Belovis Painting Corp was deemed non-responsive for failure to submit its form of proposal as outlined in the authority's bid documents. The second lowest bidder, UTB United Technology Inc. submitted a bid that was 57.44% above the authority's cost estimate, which Capital Projects Division deemed excessive for the value of the work being performed and, um, and exceeded the budget of, for the project. The future, just to let you know, is that CPD has been conducting contractor outreach. Uh, we also uh, released on November 29th an RFEI or request for expression of interest. Uh, we're receiving comments back from bidders on December 13. And based on that, uh, those questions and comments, uh, we will put this project back out to bid um, in late December. Hey, Steve, it's Greg, what's the source of funding for this? This is a council member. Uh, this is discretionary funded sources. Okay, and then and have we notified everybody involved that we've had to do this? Uh, yes, we have, um, and we're working with City Hall and Great. getting them updates okay. as well. Thanks. Board item number twenty three. And the final board item for Capital Projects Division, we seek authorization to reject all bids for a contract for the replacement of the underground steam and condensate piping distribution system at Farragut Houses. The first lowest bidder, Welkin Mechanical LLC, submitted a bid that was 106.97 above the authority's cost estimate, which CPD deemed excessive for the value of the work that's being performed. The remaining of the bids uh, were between 1.2977 to 316.29%, 3, much, much higher than the authority's estimate. Uh, all, all of these bids received uh, far exceed the budget of the project. CPD is currently reviewing the documents uh, and we'll be putting this back out to bid. Um, we are looking at other procurement methods if uh, we continue to have high bids on this project. Uh, Steve, it's Greg uh, with another question. So here where all the vendors came in with a price above the estimate, does that tell us anything? I mean, I mean, I guess what I'm asking is if we had the resources, should we accept the 106.97 since we've got everybody above the benchmark we should be, or is there something else going on? Um. We think there's something else going on. We did have, um, even in this this board calendar, we have a uh, underground steam condensate piping distribution project that was under budget or okay. was at our budget. Um, we were looking at these, uh, we are looking at the drawings to make sure that uh, there aren't any questions or comments that may have added to their costs as well as having conversations with the contractors themselves so that way we understand why their bids are so high but you are you, you do hit a, a a point which is there is a supply chain issue in new york city and we are feeling that in our bids uh, we do know that there is a labor shortage in new york city and we are feeling that as well in our bids we're monitoring those things, um, but we want to make sure that we're prudent with the funds that, that we receive, uh, and, um, and, and we'll keep you and the board up to date on that. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Chair, did you have comments on 19 through 21? I, I think I cut you off. No, that's it's uh, they got answered. So okay, great. Yeah, I was satisfied. Thanks. All right, thank you so much, Chair. Twenty-three items were presented for board approval. May I have a motion to approve all twenty-three items? Motion, Vice Chair. Madam Secretary. Hello. 
Yes, Member Adams. Yes, on item 20 and 21, I'm abstaining my vote. Okay, 20 and 21, abstain, yeah. Member Adams. Thank you so much. Um, actually, I do want to, before I take the vote again, which I need to, I want to take attendance again, just to note uh, which board members are not here for the vote. Uh, Chair is here, President, still with us. Yep. Yes. Uh, Vice Chair Gonzalez. Here. Member Adams. Here. Member Austin. Here. Member Gavin. Here. Uh, and Member Gawalb. Here. Oh, you are here. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, sorry. Um, that's okay. Uh, so chair, 23 items were presented for board approval. Do I have a motion to approve the 23 items with a notation that member Adams has abstained from items 20 and 21? So move. So move. Thank, thank you, vice chair. Seconded by? Austin. Yeah. Austin, thank you, member. All in favor? Aye. 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 None opposed. Thank you so much, Chair. Being that all matters before the board today have been addressed, may I have a motion uh, to adjourn this meeting? Board member? Motion. Vice Chair, thank you. Seconded by? Austin. Gavin. Yes, I'll take Gavin. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 None opposed. Thank you so much. The recorded end time is 11. 35 a.m. Thank you all. The next NYCHA board meeting, a non-voting meeting, is scheduled for Wednesday, December 15th at 10.30 a.m. Stay safe, everyone, and have a great day. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.